Hello, I'm JW. Uh, this time I'm going to have a look at an extractor fan, and I've got this uh, example here. Now this one's actually broken, but it uh, doesn't matter, we'll uh, take it apart and uh, see what's inside. But uh, this is a fairly typical example. This is what's called an inline fan, as in it goes uh, typically in the attic or loft space above your room. And then uh, the motor's obviously there, somewhat quieter than having it directly mounted in the ceiling. And then typically you would have something like this, this sort of expandable ducting. On the end of that, in the ceiling of the room, usually the bathroom, you would have something along the lines of one of those. And then outside, you have another one, probably something like that. So uh, fairly simple to install in that regard. You can also get these, uh, which actually mount directly in the ceiling or the wall. Again, you usually get that sort of flexible ducting to go to a thing on the outside. They tend to be a bit noisier because, of course, the motor's then in the room with the people, whereas this can obviously go in the roof and be uh, remotely located. But uh, the actual principle of operation is pretty much the same. Now, this particular one is a timer model, meaning that uh, once it's started going, you can keep it going and it will automatically turn off after a delay of, say, 10 or 15 minutes or whatever. And these are quite often attached to the lighting, so that when you go in the room and turn the light on, the fan will start going. And then when the light's turned off, the fan keeps going for, say, another 10, 15 minutes or whatever, and then switches off automatically. Now, so this one's actually broken, and you can see a bit of... Uh, burning issue going on on the uh, casing there, so we'll uh, have a look, take it apart, and see how these things actually work. So here's the fan in question. This is a fairly old one. It's been in there for a number of years and uh, was removed because it doesn't work anymore. And it's fairly straightforward. You've got two uh, outlets here. These are 100 millimeter, all designed to fit into 100 millimeter ducting. That's that flexible stuff we saw before. And we can see the uh, actual blades in there, which of course rotate. This is the inlet, and the outlet, uh, again, same size, it's got this uh, sort of non-return actual flap on it, so if the, uh, when it's turned off, if any draft comes in, it doesn't create a cold draft in the room. And uh, this is a uh, say larger body, which is one advantage of these inline ones, you can get them somewhat more powerful than all in the wall types, of course, how restricted by the size of this piece which goes in the wall. Wiring goes into this little box here, there's normally a cover over this, so the cable comes in the side here, little circuit board, so mains power at the side, and then over this side it's just basically two wires that come out and they go through the casing into the motor inside. Now you can get these without the timer part, and on those ones there's no circuit board, it's just the wires of the motor are directly connected to your incoming supply. Now in terms of the actual wiring connections, uh, this one has three terminals here, which are the line and neutral, on the outside here, so it says permanent line there, or live, and the neutral, so that needs to be connected permanently to the power. And then the middle one is the switch one, and this is what actually activates the thing that uh, starts it going. So in the default state, you've just got power supplied, nothing actually happens. But when the middle one is connected to line as well, then the fan will start running. And then even if you disconnect this, and that's not, say, normally from the light switch or whatever, then as long as the power is still applied to the two outer terminals, then the thing will keep running, and after a predefined day, a delay, it will turn off and then just go back to the sort of default state until power is applied again to the central pin. And in here we've got uh, this little adjustment here, which is for the time delay. They're not actually marked, it's just a question of that one end is about five minutes and then the other end is uh, almost half an hour, so it's just sort of guessing in approximate position in the middle. You'll notice this one has quite a lot of browning and burning on the board, that's because these tend to get fairly hot when they're in use. Various components there we'll look at uh, later. And then here, just the two wires coming out, uh, which just go straight through in the casing for the motor that's inside. And uh, this one, say, the board is dated 2002, but the actual uh, fan is considerably newer than that. That's uh, when the board was designed. Now, if you get one of these, you want to actually run it without the timer, so, for example, you've just bought the wrong one and uh, you've only got a line in neutral available, then all you need to do is just put the neutral in there, put the line into one of these, and then just put a link between the two line terminals, which means that essentially when the power is applied there, it would run, and then when the power is removed, of course, it will uh, not work. And the other thing you could do is to remove the circuit board completely, just connect your line and neutral to the two wires here, which will achieve the same result. And for reasons we'll look at later, that's probably better than leaving the circuit board in place if you don't actually need the timer function. And so you can actually buy these without the timer board in for slightly less money. 
So we'll just start by removing this uh, timing board here. So I'll just undo the terminals here using this high quality screwdriver, which somebody sent in. And uh, just pull it out of there. And then these normally just click in place. So pretty much just remove that. You can see the heat damage on the plastic here, the sort of brown coloration that would have been white originally. And it obviously matches up with the darkening on the circuit board, which we'll say look at later on. When you buy these, there is actually a cable clamp thing on here. This one's been obviously removed when the wires were taken out. And they normally come with a sort of rubber grommet thing that fits in the hole in there. And in terms of mounting these, it's just these two slots either side. So you normally put a couple of screws into a timber joist or whatever that was candy. Slot this over and then just tighten it down to fix it in position. Now, so the two wires here go through into the motor. The problem with these some uh, years ago is a lot of these didn't have much in the way of sealing here. So if you mounted this the correct way, which is supposed to be that way up, condensation inside basically came down, came through this hole, dripped onto the circuit board and shorted out and destroyed it. That uh, does appear to have some sealing on it, so that wouldn't apply to this particular one. Now let's take the rest of it apart. So we've got screws around the edge here. Of course you wouldn't normally do this for a uh, new one, but because this is an old one and we want to see what's inside, we'll be uh, taking it open anyway. So we'll just remove those three screws. Of course we've got a screw here on the base part, so we'll take that off as well. That presumably just holds this space piece in position. Moment. And then this should pull apart. So this is just plastic moulding. So you see it's rather dusty and disgusting inside. And then it's got this sort of crossed piece here. So we need to stop large objects going through. So there's the main uh, rotor on this one. So the motor in this doesn't work, it's actually showing it's open circuit. So whatever the fault is, it's the windings of the motor. This part here presumably will just ease off in some fashion. And then we've got the wires going through, but uh, they may get damaged in the process. Uh, yeah, that just clips off, so there's basically the wiring box snaps over that terminal there, hole for the wires to go through, and the circuit board just uh, clips down in the bottom as we saw previously. So here's the actual uh, motor component here. And another failure of some of these, if these go brittle over time, they can actually break off. And if one breaks off, the whole thing is then horribly unbalanced. So as it actually rotates, it uh, basically vibrates and shakes itself to pieces. So if you get one of these that suddenly turns really noisy, then the option is to replace it because sooner or later it's just going to fly apart and disintegrate. Now, though, these are not supposed to be taken apart, but uh, we'll just... Uh, go in as far as we can. Got a couple of screws there on the back, so let's certainly be getting rid of them. So again, this is just a plastic moulding, again with that uh, cross piece in there and the back draft shutter just clips in there with a little hair type spring in the middle problems there and uh, so the rest is just a moulding. Seems to be some kind of line there where the two bits were either glued or pressed together so that's similarly on the other one as well. So there's the plastic rotor, just broke the middle out and you see it's just pressed or basically glued over the motor shaft there when it's made so it's a one-time only kind of installation and just a little AC motor there just your two wires coming in, so it doesn't matter which way around those are connected. Of course, it will run just as well in either one. That says Johnson on the back of there, and there's a few uh, other numbers and things on it as well. As I say, this shows as open circuit, so obviously one of the windings has failed on this, or maybe the uh, probably a thermal fuse in there, which may well be the culprit that's actually failed. So let's see if we can just go and get in there. Overheating of these things is not going to be uncommon considering where they're actually installed using a lot of space in a hot environment. And of course the motor itself does generate a certain amount of heat as well. So I'll just pull the uh, tape away. Yep, that's definitely a thermal fuse in there. So it's fairly likely that that's what's actually failed. 
If we uh, just pull that out of there, we can possibly test that. Obviously, it's not going to work now. We've uh, pulled it out of there, but almost guaranteed that that is going to be the culprit. So. the uh, fuse from that. Yeah, it won't be seen on the camera, but 134 degrees centigrade is what it's rated for, so essentially when it gets to that temperature it will be open circuit and then not work anymore. So let's see if this is actually working. There's just continuity here, so if there is continuity then uh, some sort of noise should occur, so I'll just clip on one end and clip to the other. Yep, and as expected it's open circuit, so the deal here is then that the motor got too hot, thermal fuse operated and of course now it doesn't work anymore, and it's not realistic to repair these, you could theoretically undo it and remove the windings and re-connect sort of connect all the bits and pieces and put a new fuse in or whatever, but you're not going to do that, and plus this is a one-time fix only, and these things are fairly cheap to buy anyhow, so not a repairable product. Now here's the circuit board, so it's the mains inlet at this side, so a neutral switch line and line there. And this huge resistor here is obviously a resistive dropper kind of arrangement. And then the output here is where the fan would connect. And this is all at uh, mains voltage, there's no uh, sort of transformers or anything to reduce the voltage down. And you'll notice the considerable amount of overheating and uh, burning damage on here, it's because this resistor is going to get pretty hot even in normal operation. And because this uh, will be powered all the time, because of the virtue of the permanent power on the outer pins, this is going to be powered all the time, so it's just going to sit there wasting away power 24 hours a day. And if you look on the back of the circuit board, you see the normal green colour here. And then in this area here, you see it's considerably blackened and darkened where the heat damage has occurred. And the same on this piece here, you see the discoloration of the plastic. And that's actually come through to the outside of the case. Now I've actually got another one of these here, which is from another fan. This was one which was never actually used. It was taken out because the fan needed was a non-timed version. So, as I said earlier, just basically remove this and connect the motor directly to the power supply. And you'll see the considerable difference in the colour of it. This is a more sort of orangey colour, and that's obviously burnt and rather horrible. And again, the back. This one looks considerably better than that one. Now let's have a look at the uh, circuit board in a bit more detail. So this is where the power comes in. You see it's marked with the neutral line and the switch line there to actually activate the thing. This here is the little adjuster for the time. So it's just basically from one end to the other, just a variable resistor there. And so it's normally from about five minutes in the minimum position to about 30 minutes at maximum. So I sort of set it there, it's probably about 15 or so. Not particularly uh, accurate and not actually marked either, so it's a bit of a trial and error to see how it actually works. This uh, huge resistor here is obviously being used to reduce the voltage there, so a resistive dropper. Rather wasteful, but uh, that's uh, how it's designed. A couple of electrolytic capacitors here, and in the middle here we've got uh, a couple of little diodes there, two more resistors and then a larger diode. Another resistor over that side, and then another diode down in there, and at this end a single resistor, and then this transistor presumably here, which will be what's switching the actual output on and off for the fan itself. And let's turn that around, we can get a closer look at the numbers on that one. And again, if we look at the back of there, we'll see that this is the output of one of the output terminals, get straight to that transistor. This will be the central pin, which is going to be the one that's used to do the control. And then the other side of that transistor basically is all the way along this track, right to the other end. And that actually goes to the terminal at this end. And if you have a look at that terminal, you'll see it's actually the neutral. So this is actually switching the neutral for the output. And if you look at the line here, that's the line output. And you'll see the track goes all the way along and basically right through to the terminal on the input. So for the uh, input is permanently line, goes all the way through to the outside, and then the neutral is actually what's switched. Now uh, the only other thing on this board is this chip, and you may have thought it's some kind of microcontroller or some other fancy piece, but if you have a look here carefully, it's a 4001, so basically it's just a set of logic gates, there's actually four 
in this particular package. And all of the timing on this board is all analog, so there's no digital actual timing or microcontroller or processor or anything. It's purely relying on the fact that we've got a resistor here, a couple of capacitors, and those basically creating a time delay along with the uh, resistors as well. And then this is just a set of uh, four logic gates, which have been wired up in such a way that uh, the time delay therefore turns the output on, and then afterwards it will go off and not actually go into a uh, continuous oscillating cycle of uh, going on and off. So quite a straightforward and simple design, somewhat flawed in the fact it's got this uh, rather wasteful resistor there, but uh, nevertheless it does work and uh, does the job. So uh, no digital equipment here, it's a analog timer. And of course that explains why there's no accurate markings on this dial, because you're literally just changing the value of a resistor. And of course the other components are not particularly critically toleranced either, so uh, actual position of that does vary depending on things like temperature and whatever will affect the length of time that it runs for. So let's look inside a fairly typical extractor fan. I say others are going to be pretty much the same kind of deal. This circuit board in particular is used in a whole load of different fans, whether it's the sort of in line there or the mountain the wall variety, and even shows up under different manufacturers, although different brand names may well be made by the same manufacturer anyhow, so uh, not too clear whether that actually is the case. This thing uh, is a remarkably simple design, no microcontrollers or digital electronics, it's purely an analogue timer, it just relies on the value of the uh, little resistor there to vary that, so not particularly accurate, but then doesn't need to be. It's just to keep it going for, say, 10-15 minutes or something after you've left the room. And they do get rather hot in operation, so as you saw on the other one, the resistor area is rather hot and burnt, but that's purely down to the design. Resistive droppers are somewhat wasteful, as the, uh, the wasted energy basically is just thrown away as heat into the uh, little resistor there. But uh, nevertheless, does the job. And if you find one that's, uh, say, failed, it's uh, worthwhile just checking whether it's this little board or it's just the actual fan motor. If it is just the little board, you can at least temporarily get it working by simply connecting the motor directly to the incoming supply, and then obviously replace it later, or even leave it like that if a timer was not required. But say in this case, the actual motor is what's failed, so no help there. So that's it for this time, and until next time, thanks for watching.